I'm not saying this just uh, as a point of rhetoric. Uh, I say this uh, in view of the fact that we live in the 21st century, a century in which participation, sharing, transparency are the key defining elements of legitimacy for any power. If you uh, monopolize power and do not share it with others, you will have a very hard time legitimizing or having any kind of legitimacy and justification uh, for that power. And for that to happen, I, I, I personally believe that the question of Eurocentrism must be overcome in the widest sense of the term. Because if you look at this current picture, there is very little place for the non-Western people of the world. Where are the Chinese in the ordinary textbooks of world civilization or world history? Where are the Indians? Where are the South Africans? Where are the Latin Americans? Now, they are becoming the big players of the world, but we don't recognize that yet. And some people still have difficulty reconciling with, with the fact that, in fact, other nations of the world uh, have uh, equal rights, equal, uh, deserve equal respect uh, from us. And this is what we try to do uh, in our foreign policy uh, in our part of the world. Now, uh, let me just turn to uh, another four important instruments that we use to implement this. And I'll uh, end with uh, two issues that uh, Chairman Chelik mentioned, and, uh, and uh, hope that this background will help you understand uh, the actions that we took uh, that and the policies we are pursuing on these two issues. Uh, particularly in the Middle East, uh, we uh, follow four main uh, principles or instruments to implement those policy goals, objectives that I outline here. The first is engaging all political actors in the region. The, again, uh, reflected in our engagement with Syria, uh, with Hamas in Palestine, uh, with Iran, uh, with various groups in, inside Lebanon, with various groups inside Iraq, uh, in Afghanistan, and other places. Of course, we do this to the extent of our ability. You know, we never claim that you know, we have the mo magic formula, we are the supermen of the world, and we will solve all the problems. No. Uh, but we try to use our strategic power, strategic thinking, to the extent possible. Engaging all political actors, we believe, is in line with the general uh, foreign policy um, uh, perspective that President Obama has also outlined, that is engagement, multilateralism, uh, diplomacy, uh, and we've started doing this uh, even before these principles were reenacted as the main principles, guiding principles of American foreign policy. Uh, secondly, uh, we respect the results of democratic elections uh, in the region, we don't uh, get into the, the issue of nation building or meddling into in the internal affairs of other countries, but we try to create an environment, a context, political, economic, social context, in which these values of democracy, rule of law, transparency, uh, human rights, uh, will gain further significance and will become realities rather than just rhetoric. But there are ways of doing this, and uh, we have seen the ones that have failed in the past. So we have to try some new methods, obviously, to make uh, this happen. Uh, our third important principle or, or instrument that we use is, uh, is to cooperate with uh, regional and global actors. In all of the engagements that Chairman Chelik mentioned, and I, and I added to it also Lebanon, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, uh, we work very closely with our regional and uh, other allies, that is in Europe and, uh, and the United States. I'll come back to this uh, because this is important uh, not only to justify the acts but also to do it with efficiency. And uh, there seems to be a lot of confusion you know, in some parts of the world about how to implement this principle. And finally, uh, our uh, fourth instrument that we use is to increase social economic cooperation uh, between the countries in the region, increase people-to-people -people communication, get them out of the sense of isolation. Uh, that they've been locked into for, for so many years, and particularly speaking about, uh, about the Middle East. Uh, increase cultural economic cooperation, uh, educational cooperation, so that there will be uh, uh, further interaction uh, uh, between, uh, between the countries uh, that will benefit us, that will benefit them uh, as well. Now, uh, I know I'm running out of my time, so I will... Uh, because on each of these principles, I can spend another half an hour, so uh, I don't want to keep you here for the rest of the day. But let me just uh, uh, relate this to uh, the two issues, uh, 
to recent issues that have been on our agenda for the last uh, two, three weeks. Uh, first, the Iran vote, the Iran no vote, which seems to have created such um, disappointment, uh, uh, displeasure, and uh, what was the other word that we've been hearing? Uh, anyway, these are the words that we've been hearing since we came to Washington, and I, I use them deliberately uh, here. Uh, we've been engaged with the Iran file for uh, almost two years now, actively. Of course, we've been following it very closely for a number of years, but uh, our active direct involvement has been taking uh, place for uh, almost close to two years now. And uh, throughout that process, uh, we have been uh, in close consultation with our American and European friends, and of course with the Iranians at the time, and at times when the, uh, communication simply broke down between our European and American friends on the one hand and Iran uh, on the other. But what we did with the Tehran Declaration of May 17 was, uh, we believe, in perfect agreement with uh, the discussions that we have had with our uh, European and American colleagues. That is, uh, the three conditions that have been met in the Tehran Declaration of May 17 were put together uh, through those consultations. The three conditions were, the first was to get 1,200 kilograms of low-enriched uranium out of Iran, to do it through another country, not in Iran, that is, the exchange will have to take place in another country, not inside Iran. And third, it will have to be in one installment, not in pieces, but in one installment. Those three conditions are met in the Tehran Declaration. And they are the most important confidence-building measure so far. For the last six, seven years, with all due respect to our American and European friends, they have not been able to convince the Iranians to come up with even a position paper on the nuclear issue, not to speak of getting them sign a document. For the first time, we have, with the Brazilians, we have been able to get them to sign a document, to commit themselves to something that is concrete, and still on the table. The reason why, first of all, I mean, I have to uh, emphasize the significance of this. Uh, and uh, we put a lot of time, energy, and our own credibility on the line for this. And we believe we achieved something that, uh, in our understanding, was very much what uh, our European and American friends also want out of these negotiations. Now, uh, after the Tehran Declaration, only a few hours after the declaration of the Tehran Agreement, it was dismissed. And now you can understand the frustration that has, that, that has created for us. That is, after working so hard to get this agreement, uh, it was, within hours, it was dismissed. And they said, all right, you know, we won't pay, pay too much attention to it. Let's keep working on this. But even after that, we were told that we should continue diplomatic engagement with Iran. That is all right. We, we understand that. That should continue. Maybe there should be a dual track. And we'll work on that. And we did. On June 9th, uh, the UN vote, the reason why Turkey voted w uh, no was for two reasons. The first was to avoid contradicting ourselves because we already have achieved something that is concrete, workable, and still on the table. 